haven't made it to the uh, the River Drift Adventure yet. Went had to go there yesterday. It's pre-scouted out. It's quite a ways away, and uh, see exactly where I could get the Zodiac into the river and where I could possibly pull it out once it hits the lake. And that lake was exactly 20 kilometer run to get to the other boat ramp that I found, but I did find a place to pull out not too far away from the mouth of the river. So that's going to be a go, but unfortunately I just couldn't get my partner organized today. I thought about going there solo today and getting dropped off with the boat and drifting, but then I'd have to hope for cell service somewhere down there, which I forgot to check yesterday, to uh, get picked up again. So. And now I have to pack up my stuff to head out to the coast tomorrow. And uh, so that's not going to happen for a handful of days. Got some items to do out there. And yes, I am going bear hunting. It's actually a monster bear. It's basically being a bad apple at the fishing lodge. And uh, it's fairly remote there. And he's uh, already tried to kill the dog on the porch at the lodge. Then he went down to the dock and rampaged the bait freezer. <laughs> that turns out to be fairly expensive and he's going to get shot no matter what not out of my control so i will go down there i'm going to take my bow and drift for him i'll find him and i'll harvest him with the bow and arrow and then utilize his entire carcass instead of just him getting dusted as a problem bear and throwing in a hole right so that's what i'm going to be doing the next few days and as well uh yeah that's what i'm going to be doing but anyway, I got an important reply from the Owl Man, as anticipated, um, when we had a subscriber reach out for help and knowledge. And here we go. It's about the dreams, right? Dream time. This is titled Dream Time and a few other answers and two pictures. Steve, I want to personally thank you for taking the time out of your busy life to not just read my emails, but everyone else's. Your dedication to helping people deal with this subject is admirable. I do not think anyone has built anything like you have when it comes to this topic. I know it was not the intention, and that is the beauty of it. It doesn't get much more organic than this. It is obvious to all you have a heart for your fellow man. You unknowingly have unlocked a treasure trove of information for people who could never get honest information for something that is deemed laughable. For me personally, you have provided confirmation on things I've been sitting on for years and not having a chance to really get it out there to help others who have questions or have been traumatized. In a way, you have given me a way to tell it all out there. Trust me, there were others who rejected all this information. You're an honorable man with great integrity. And so are you, man. Thank you for the kind words, but so are you. And uh, this channel is nothing without you and all the other people like you, right? And I, I don't, I, I haven't wasted too much time wondering why this is happening or how this has gotten so popular, but I can tell you one simple answer of why it is because the people have been saturated, our societies have been saturated with bullshit actors, posers, and um, opportunistic freaks. That is why straight up no bullshit honest knowledge is a winner today. There's no way out of it. Honest knowledge, no bullshit, is much needed. It's a rare commodity these days and is much needed. That's why. I'm sure it doesn't matter who it is, anybody else offers up some no bullshit have had enough of the bullshit place it's going to have the same reaction today it's a winner honesty is a winner today it's, it's rare right and it's all because of all of you out there every one of you that's that's why that's that's i said it before in the past it's your channel you guys this is your channel now it's your channel so here we go let's get on with it as you've already surmised this email is is, is in response to people who have had issues with dreams of the wild people. I'll add a few other things you and others have mentioned, so this may be a long email, so please forgive me. Let her rip, dude. Nobody forgive, ask for forgiveness. We want the longer emails. Longer emails, more knowledge. Dreams are important to the savvy. To them, it is a link to the spirit, to the great creator. To them, dreams are sacred and have great meaning. They call this the dream time. I've mentioned before in previous emails, they have the ability to connect to our brain waves. If this sounds crazy, people need to understand their own scientists are working on a way to communicate like this. It really is not that hard. If we have the ability to match our individual brain waves, you can, you can talk to another person without ever using your mouth. This is how they can mind speak, put thoughts in your head, project fear or peace. They can make you see things that are not there. They can wipe your memory. 
I am told that some are so powerful they can kill you with a thought. I have no idea if this is true or not, so take it easy out there everybody. Read that part. I'll explain as much as I can from my own experience with the dream time. I once mentioned that myself and my mentor sat in the dark several nights a week for about three years interacting with the Sabbath. This was years before I ever experienced the crazy stuff they do. I mention this because I had some life-altering encounters with them. Some downright terrifying. I could tell you stories for hours, but they really are not important anymore. One night my mentor and I were sitting in our typical spot waiting for the savvy to make themselves known. He mentioned that they found it odd that he has never had a dream about them. I remember saying, come to think about it, neither have I. We thought it was really strange. We were told our dreams are just our subconscious mind putting the day's experiences in filing cabinets of your mind, of our mind. Like I said, some encounters with them were scary as hell, yet I never had a good or a bad dream involving them. Before I wrote this, I called my friend to discuss this. He, for some reason, still never had any dreams with them, or good or bad, and he has seen and experienced more before he ever met me. It is rather strange when you think about it. When the mind-speaking ability of these beings revealed itself, the dreams arrived. It happened rather quickly and unexpectedly. The best way to describe a dream they influenced is lucid. Lucid dreams are dreams where you know you are dreaming and you can control or direct the dream. People can be trained to dream lucid. I had no idea what it was, but every dream I have had with them is a lucid dream. There are also dreams that are more like an open vision. It is like your spirit is removed and you're physically there in the moment. If I recall the Sabe, if I recall, the Sabe call that an event. It is like you have been taken somewhere and brought back. It is an out-of-body experience. Is it an out-of-body experience? Possibly. You've had emails from others who have this happen. The man from Park Forest, Illinois, who was looking at a baby turtle and was picked up by a savvy comes to mind. The big question is, why do they do this? They do not, they do not just do this to anyone, especially an event. Remember I mentioned if they like you or, or hate you, there will be issues. Anyone who seeks out the savvy can attempt to gain their trust. I never really intended to do so. For me, it was unexpected and possibly accidental. In general, the Sabbaths have always been betrayed by humans. Time and time again, someone gains their trust and they usually betray them in some manner. It often got them injured or killed. If you built a friendship with one who trusted you enough to show himself to anyone you bring to meet him, expect that person to tell others and then it all goes to shit. You'd be surprised how often this has happened. So instead of just openly trusting us, they will use dreams to see how you will react to them. I will use some examples. The first dream I had involving them had to do with a very large, hairy, but feminine hand reaching out to me. It's just a very large, brown hair covered hand with long, slender fingers. It's not nasty or scary looking. In this dream, I am looking at this hand and the thought comes to me, what are you going to do with this hand? I remember saying, may I reach out and touch this hand? I was granted permission, and when I reached out and touched, a finger was, I was instantly awake. I sat up out of the bed. Honestly, it seemed real beyond imagination. I found out about a week later, this dream was done on purpose by a high-ranking female savvy who wanted to test my reaction to something as simple as her hand. She told me her name in that dream which I have in my notes. All this was planned by some higher-ranking clan to see if I was worth trusting. There were many dreams that followed. The vast majority of them had a recurring theme. I would find myself in some wild place with a savage hiding behind something, not willing to show himself to me. I would know in the dream I was dreaming, and I would always tell the savage that I see him, and I was not afraid, and he can show himself. They usually did, and he would tell me his name. I would tell him thank you, and then wake up. I had quite a few of these in the beginning, and they slowly and they tapered off. And then they tapered off, sorry. I no longer have this happen much. I did have one last July, a month before, after I got married. The savvy saw my wife in the dreams. She didn't see him and he looked at me, put a finger to his mouth and nodded towards my wife. He didn't want 
me to tell her. He then pointed towards her and said, you made a good choice. He smiled at me and told me his name. You need to know, you need to know I doubted my choice. All the dream time encounters I have had are like this. I just see them as introductions, not nightmares. No nightmares, no nothing crazy, just simply introductions. It is a safe way for them to dig into your true intentions towards them. As for the events, I know several women who had these. The theme is pretty much the same. Introductions and the testing of your reactions in a dream state. In the end, it all comes to one thing. The Sabbe are trying to decide if they can trust you in person and should they take the risk of actually physically presenting themselves to that person. If you recall, I once mentioned I developed a profile for people who seem to have the ability to mind speak with them. They can sense this in us as children. If they sense this is in a human child, they will often keep tabs on that child well into adulthood, trying to make contact with that person or debating if they should. They know we see them as monsters and are terrified of their appearance. You have had quite a few people write wondering why their children seem to be targets. You have plenty of adults speaking of how they've seen them since they were children. We have, when we mature, we seem to let logic, reason, fear, and doubt become the hallmark of human reasoning, and we lose those abilities we were born with. No doubt. In our minds, we are thinking they want to kidnap, rape, murder, or eat our children. There's nothing wrong with being concerned as a parent, just do not automatically think the worst. It's really sad when you think about the human condition. We start out innocent, unafraid, and have a curious mind. Then adulthood sets in and that ends. So why do the Sabbe try to contact some people? A segment of the Sabbe's, a segment of the Sabbe's insists that there is a coming, that there is coming a time when humanity will need them. Simply put, the Sabbe and humanity are going to have to come together for a greater cause in some type of catastrophe that they do not fully understand. You know, it's funny. Scott Carpenter is always saying he wouldn't trust them. The majority of the Sabbe say that about us. In fact, it's one of the things that divide their people. Historically, we have proven to be betrayers and untrustworthy. Frankly, too many of them think we are not worth the trouble. Sadly, I have to agree with them. Look how we are. They can't be bribed. They don't value any type of material objects. Everything to them is about community and relationships to each other, which leads me to the next thing. In order to grasp how they think you need to research autistic and OCD tendencies. Sorry, let me read that again. In order to grasp how they think you need to research autistic and OCD tendencies. I noticed a long time ago that the way they express themselves through mind speak was not normal. It is like they have some sort of brain disorder. Perfect example of this, when I give them, when I gift them with something, it tends to be something to make life a little better. Blankets. Yes, they will use them, but you have to explain how. Imagine having to explain something like that and that it will help keep you warm. I have gifted them with a long hickory axe handles to use as a weapon against dogmen. Those will not break when you use it as a club. The idea of its durability they could not quite grasp. It is like they are missing the part of the brain that deals with innovation and long-term forward thinking. I will say this, once you teach them something they never forget and they teach others, which can cause bigger issues down the line. Kind of like Star Trek's prime directive interfering with another culture's development. A close interaction and relationship with one of us can come at a great cost individually and collectively. A clan leader is responsible for his clan. His decisions affect all those who fall under his authority. If something bad happens because of his friendship towards an individual human, the clan suffers. The behaviors of pounding on walls, looking through windows, turning doorknobs, things that so many people consider to be terrorizing are often younger ones goofing around. Kind of like humans pulling pranks and practical jokes. They do not have a sense of humor, but it's more Three Stooges versus Dennis Miller. Sometimes these behaviors are just simply curiosity or just trying to get your attention for the good or bad. 
If they want to, they could tear your home down like a wrecking ball or push the door in instead of just playing with the doorknob like a toddler. The sense of humor of autistic people tend to be appreciated by their family, not strangers. Other aspects of the autistic spectrum is the swaying back and forth. When the savvies are anxious or nervous, they will often try to self-soothe themselves by rocking back and forth or swaying back and forth. In autistic people, this is called stiping. We see that and to use and to us, they are sizing us up for some kind of attack. Okay, sorry, I just butchered that sentence. We see that, and to us, they are sizing us up for some kind of an attack. In reality, they are trying to calm themselves down. Once again, human misunderstanding of a different mindset. They do a lot of things that can be called stiping. Some of the tree structures, formations, and odd things they do are this. You can even say some of the stuff is obsessive compulsive disorder. The rock stacking and so forth. I will include two pictures out of my collection of how they seem to have this desire to put specific things in order like sticks, limbs, rocks, or bones. Bones. As for limb formations, some of it is the OCD. Some are glyphs that have actual meanings. Some of those glyphs with small sticks left on your porch or such are meant to be some type of blessing on your household. I know the big X that people see actually indicates a meeting place. It's a greeting or a place to rendezvous. We see it as no trespassing. There are other formations that are trail markers for strangers and lost young ones, but I honestly forgot what those look like. I was really never interested, interested in that stuff, to be honest, so I forgot what the savvies have spoken of on this. Yeah, I don't have, it's funny, I, don't, I honestly don't have any interest for structures in the timber. I just don't. I've noticed them new, numerous times myself, and it just, I have zero concern, curiosity about it myself. It's kind of odd, isn't it? But I don't. I see it, I think, oh yeah. They did that, no doubt, and then I carry on with my day. Sorry. As for fire, only their medicine men are allowed to make and use fire. One of those rules. Fire is considered very dangerous and nothing to be played with. They have a healthy fear of it. From what they have said, they only use fire in ceremonies. The passing of a loved one, I know they will make a small fire for. Or for making herbal medications. The fires they make are very small. I asked how they make the fire, and it basically translates into creating a ball of some type of energy to ignite the wood. They know fires can easily get out of control. Yeah, uh, Mount St. Helens come to a, a uh, thought there. Do they migrate? Yes and no. Clan leaders and their family never leave their territory. Other members of the clan are free to go where they are welcome. Some are what we would call snowbirds. I've actually spoke with many of these. Like us, some savvy don't want to deal with a harsh winter, so they will leave their home clan for the winter to spend with another clan in more favorable conditions. For example, you may have some savvy in Northern Canada that may prefer the winter in Lower Michigan. You may have some savvy in Lower Michigan who like Southeastern Ohio. This is also dependent on where they are welcomed. Like us, you just don't leave your home and spend the winter with strangers. Typically, they are related to someone or are friends with the clan they spend the winter with. They have a cultural thing here. They do not seem to take a mate till they are in their 30s. A male will leave to live. A male will leave to live with his woman's clan. So, just like us, a couple with a family may leave for winter to stay with the in-laws. I know that in the Midwestern United States, if a savvy leaves for the winter, they do it in November before as they call it, the snow flies. They will return to their home clan in March. How many of them engage in this behavior, I have no idea. I do know that some of them just find the cold of areas like northern Minnesota, not to their liking, but don't mind winter in Iowa. Everything I've spoken of here, I'm pulling out of memory. I have notes I took of conversations with several individual Saturdays. I hope this helps shed light on some things and helps put some puzzle pieces together. I like to think I have represented humanity well to the savvy. I have tried to present us in a more of a positive light. They have some crazy ideas about us. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to present them in a positive light as well, but it's hard as hell. Everyone wants to point them as demons. 
They had no choice in their, in their parentage any more than any of us have. They are living, breathing, sentient beings, and like it or not, the closest thing to our humanity in existence. Just like us, some of them have issues. I know I'm not the only one who knows these things. I stress I am not an expert. Everything they have spoken of can be complete and utter bullshit. But I always give them the benefit of the doubt. If you study human history, we have proven to be treacherous. We love to commit genocides based on physical, cultural, political, and religious reasons. The Sabe are physically scary as hell to us. Something we label scary typically does not do well. I refuse to behave like our ancestors or our current elected officials. The Sabe see me as a friend, or at least not a threat, and I'm good with that. I've kept every promise I've made to them. I will not betray them or break my word. We can get along with these beings. We don't have to be friends, but somewhere along the line, we have to live in some type of peace. They have code of vengeance you do not want to experience. So I would never advise shooting one without good justifiable cause. Once again, I do apologize for the length of this, but I really hope that it helps those who have ears to hear. Blessings to all those who have understanding, the owl man. And there's the photos. And I will, uh, I'll, I'll add those in. <laughs> I hope I don't screw up. I screw up a lot with those, don't I? Just goes to show how uh, the photos in my mind don't seem to uh, connect too strongly. There we go. Another much appreciated email from the Owl Man. Obviously, I know the Owl Man's name, but I'll keep referring to you, sir, as the Owl Man. And uh, what an interesting ride. A lot of people out there having one hell of an interesting ride this lifetime compared to many other people, aren't they? <laughs> one hell of an interesting ride, man. Oh, the migration thing. I always kind of laugh at the migration thing only because the migration note is usually, is usually directed, delivered from people who look at these beings as a simple game animal, right? And that's why I often laugh at the migration note. Uh, myself, I talked to some First Nations people where I was previously living. And I talked to a young guy who was very familiar with these people around his community of Mount Curry. And uh, we had a good conversation some years back. We were comparing notes. I was telling him where I don't go any, I just don't go hang out anymore. And he agreed with me on all the spots and he had it in a couple other familiar places that he doesn't go either. And he's seen them four different times. And uh, one time he was actually hunting in the woods and unfortunately he's going to the bathroom, squatting down, going to the bathroom in the bush and a large red one rose up in the bushes almost right in front of him, like a mere yards away. I never forgot he told me that one. And that was near Joffrey Lakes. So anyway, Joffrey Lakes also where I knew of nine people who were camping overnight and seen one of these things come up over the glacier and down into their side. And they felt like they were staring at it all night long. But anyways, get back to the migration thing. I remember asking him, because that was back when I was semi-intentionally seeking them out around there. Because there's just so, so many experiences around that area. It was just ridiculous. It was far, far easier for me in that community to find someone who had an experience with these people than it was who'd seen a cougar. And there's cougars everywhere around there. So anyways, I asked him, I said, are they here full time? And, or are they out of here in the winter time? Because we have, excuse me, such a massive snow load there. Then as well, Pemberton, British Columbia is a, an international destination for snowmobilers in the winter. And of course you've got Whistler Ski Mountain, is, is, I think it's one of the best in the world. Uh, ski destinations on the planet and there's people from all over the world come flocking there every winter and uh, He assured me he says no, no, they're here year-round. They're all around our community year-round And then the more I dug the more I realized that is true. You know, I had uh, friends Who are members of the search and rescue in Whistler found 18 inch footprints in the snow by the Wendy Thompson hut You can google that up. It's, it's off of that Duffy Highway and that was going downhill in the middle of winter, downhill in the snow, down towards Mount Curry, the community of Mount Curry. 
and that was dead winter and the stride was twice theirs and this and sank in the snow three times deeper than their footprints did so there was my for me at the time that was my clue for winter okay somebody's here in the winter time and then of course i'm trapping wolves and have those two blasting on trees dead middle of early february um anyway so for me that that knocked out the migration thing for me and for me that was probably why it had more of fuel for me to kind of laugh at somebody saying they migrate right um, but what one thing that stands out for me still today is the fact that the tracks will disappear like that for me that is one hell of a major serious clue that something that is up that we can't wrap our minds around. That was for me, especially for me because I've been basically a professional tracker for many years, right? And as the late great doc, Dr. John Bendernagel coined the term tracks or facts. So for me, be a professional game guide, hunter, gatherer, and tracker, um, for me to be forced to accept the fact that these beings tracks all of a sudden absolutely stop dead and dis done in deep snow in alpine in the middle of nowhere noted by helicopters by planes by hikers right that's what makes you go oh <laughs> there's much more to this than just a uh, a unrecognized primate there's much more going on and then that is where that's what led my brain to maturing, my gathering more knowledge, my forcing myself to accept the numerous facts being pointed out for people around the globe, not making sure I'm not keeping my head in the sand. And then I eventually morphed into actually almost being more amazed at watching human beings and wondering what the F when it comes to us as more than opposed to these beings who seem to be living a true, true, honest um, existence, as opposed to us. Our existence is saturated with bullshit. We're being taught bullshit, led by bullshit, and we have people who are, are professional bullshitters creating the narratives that the majority of society follows, which I don't. Anyway, I'm babbling. <laughs> there we go. Oh man, appreciate you man, and I'm sure you helped many people. There's people that reached out specifically to you for some input on the topics that you just tapped on. Absolutely appreciate you and your time. And um, I'm sure we'll talk in person one day, and, uh, and, and as well as I talk to numerous other persons in person one day as well. It's been challenging, I know I'm a repeating broken record when it comes to time, 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 but man, could you imagine? Uh, I just got to get through possibly my first year or maybe even my first two years of the shit show that comes along with buying a frickin' farm and and then and then life on top of that. It's a uh, it's a real real time eater, you know, it's a real time eater, but I'm getting there and uh, Same as the man cave here. It just hasn't the man cave has not changed in at all for about what a month or two because there's just been no time yet, but it's coming. I am getting caught up. And I have so many things that I want to do. There's so many, and related to this topic, there's so many things. So many things I want to do and I want to make happen. But I guess we're getting there, right? And getting back to what you just mentioned earlier in the beginning of the email, how, man, how this has created possibly one of the, the uh, more significant places when it comes to this topic. Um, that was, that creating this wasn't one of my intentions. I guess one of my intentions was to hammer, hammer out the truth, stand up and get in the face of anyone who wanted this truth suppressed and make sure I win. And um, I guess that is possibly what's happened here now as a result of that, right? We're winning. Um, so many people, I have had the same outdoor passions as me and have had it stripped of them because of this this reality. And I'm um, biting my lip because that can make me instantly growl when I think about that. And that is, uh, for me, 
I think that is my where I finally drew the line in the sand and I said for me personally to the world enough that's enough the truth's coming out and you can go F yourself if you want that truth suppressed or you want me to shut up it ain't gonna happen let's get it on it's time and that was my attitude in the beginning still is today just not as aggressive <laughs> but but this is a result what all of you have come to here and everything created here that is a result of saying no more bullshit that's enough the line's been drawn nobody's crossed it anymore this is the truth and this is it and there's, there's that's just the way it is all right that's enough before i get going everybody's gonna be hitting the fast forward button on the video so fast now let's get another one or two shared here quick so i can get out of here and get on my day this is titled The Cascade Effect. Hi Steve, greetings from the interior of Alaska. Today on the 28th of May 2022, you posted a video in which you read experiences of my friend and former co-worker named Forrest Shane Fallis. Before you had concluded reading his letter, I knew it was him based on the multiple pieces of the story. In any case, when I finished the video, I reached out to him with a text message and followed it with a second message later that evening, offering to share my own story with him. We had a long bout of text messages as he is still in Idaho and I have retired to Alaska and it ended with him recommending that I write you my experience and his last words, it helps. I wanted to pass those words on to you and to also share with you my own story. Absolutely appreciated. I'm I'm doing little mini jumping jacks in my brain when I read those words. Getting on with it. I'm nearly 63 years of age. My first experience happened nearly 40 years ago in 83 or 84. I lived in Oregon at the time and was in my early 20s. I was going up for some semi-remote van traveling and tent camping along the headwaters of the upper Clackamas River, which lies in the Mount Hood National Forest and under the jurisdiction of the Clackamas River Ranger District. This location was about 20 miles above a small town called Estacada. How many times have we heard this area? Dozens. I intended on tent camping and had arrived late in the afternoon and had set about cooking my simple dinner of stew and rolls. After dinner, I sat by the fire, sat up in my tent, and began to wind down for the evening. It was truly a beautiful location up a high bank above the river with crickets, frogs, and assorted night critters moving about and sharing their voices. I retired to the tent as the mosquitoes had just started being exceptionally active. I'd always camped armed and this trip was no exception. I had with me a 357 revolver and a 3030 lever gun. I had never thought of coming into anything of any size to really amount to much of a threat but there was always the chance of running into a dope growing operation hidden with, with the National Forest. I was laying on top of my sleeping bag reading when it started. The first thing I noticed is that all of the noises except the river stopped. The frogs, crickets, everything went out completely silent. I laid there thinking this was really weird and then the rock started, first hitting the ground around my tent, my van, then hitting the tent itself. The rock seemed to be getting bigger in size as if trying to stir a reaction from me or get my attention. Next was a wave of terror overtaking me in ways I had never felt before or since. Now, Steve, I've been within 15 feet of wolves in the wild here in Alaska and within 40 feet of adult grizzlies. And I have not felt the fear that I was feeling from these rocks are being thrown. You could feel the presence and the intent, but in the darkness, there was nothing to be seen. Next in my mind, I heard the words, get out of here, get out of here now. At that point, the first reaction I had was how outgunned I was, and I didn't have the firepower to in any way defend myself. I literally was in a total fear meltdown. Yeah, I, got I got out of my dome-style tent with it fully still assembled, threw it quickly along my backpack into the back doors of my van, and flew out there like I was being chased or on fire. I found it very difficult to return to such places, but I also have found that I am keenly aware of my surroundings now, as a rule now, and there is always one ear listening for those sounds that are out of place or changes in what, in what might be ambient slash background noises or sounds. 
Also, when I'm out now, I usually have a short 12 gauge with slugs or a 300 wind mag. What I have, what I have gleaned from hearing my friend Shane's story and in telling my own, now only for the third time, is that when we all become members of that club and no return, we may react differently. And our experiences may contain different details or elements, but one of the common thread or puzzle piece is that we are all forever changed. I wonder if it's that we're changed or we're, or we're actually all forever brought back to possibly where we used to be. The bubble that we had been taught to accept has burst and that it was a lie. Some of us deal with it as best we can, while others shut down in denial and will not discuss or acknowledge it further. Since my own experience, I have felt what I would describe as a presence. I'm sure it's the same thing you describe as pressure. I too choose not to push things and back off from these areas. I'm willing to respect their space as I am not looking to force another encounter. Thanks to you for your doing and pursuing the truth and non-judgmentally sharing all of our experiences. My friend Shane was right. It helps to share. Best wishes to you, Sarah and all your critters. P.S. My friend Shane told me that he had attached a picture to his email to you and when I watched your video, it was not uploaded to the video. This is a fairly clear picture and I will attach it again here. The backstory on this picture is that, that this came from a U.S. Forest Service place trail cam. When the image was downloaded, the picture was copied and reviewed by local ranger district managers and it was decided that it best be buried and not released to public, but not before a few copies leaked out to locals, one of which was my friend Shane. My guess is that the image was taken with an early non-IR generation of trail cam, tripped and taken on a clearly snowy day in daylight. Thanks again, Brian Ludlow. Brian, thanks man, super stoked and glad that, it's, that it helped you. And this photo, um, yeah, it's definitely kind of different, isn't it? Uh, I don't know myself, but you know what, it's, it's a photo <laughs> it's for me. You guys know my stance of photos, but I will, uh, I'll make sure I share this photo. Broad daylight in the snow. It's those long, goofy, popsicle stick-like fingernails that make me go, oh God, but who am I, right? Like I said before, it doesn't matter what I believe or not. To you. It shouldn't matter to all of you what I believe or not. It should, because I don't give a shit what anybody else thinks, right? We're all on our own individual ride. If this is, photo's legit, it's legit. If it isn't, it isn't. I haven't a clue, I never will. Unless that being covered in snow comes up and kicks me in the nuts one day. Whatever, right? But anyway, absolutely appreciate that email, man. Really, really appreciate that. That was, uh, that was great that a couple people recognize each other on here. And uh, it's helping. This channel is helping those that it is supposed to help. Everybody's welcome. All right, here's one more. Then I gotta get on my day. I gotta get some arrows flung into a target today to make sure I'm still on my game. This title for Rebecca in Alaska. Hello, Steve. You will find the note to Rebecca below the line of stars. The first, the first I want to thank you very much for standing up for what is right. You and I both know that you are open, that you open yourself up to risk with the subject, especially since you and I both come from countries that have become more and more tyrannical. I have a series of stories to send you that I've been slowly putting together over time. However, I've had a great deal to overcome in terms of physical challenges. I'm doing much better now. Thank for all you do. Sincerely, Thomas Rice. Appreciate it, man, and good luck with your healing. Get it done. You got this. I'm looking forward to what you got. Dear Rebecca, first I hope this letter finds you and your family well, happy and healthy. Thank for coming forward with your story. You have guts. Never allow anything or anyone to put you in a position of operating from fear. I know that I know what that's like and it's never good and it's never productive. Please understand that you're on an ex you are an extremely gifted person. It is obvious from your story and the many things that you did not say that you are gifted. You have the ability to put boundaries in place that will help keep our undesirable things including living that will help keep out undesirable things including living beings. To that end, let me advise you on just a couple of quick things. First, walk in an attitude of prayer, as the Apostle Paul would say. 
For myself, that means that I walk in a constant meditative state with those that I love on my heart and lips. Please stay aware of your surroundings. That starts with acknowledging the sensation of your own body and the earth beneath your feet. Take the time to feel the wind in your face and the sun shining down. Through this, you will understand that you are alive and part of creation. It is my opinion that we are born with the same abilities and gifts that God gave his own son. Please keep a dream journal beside your bed, even if all you recall is just passing images or brief flashes. Be certain to write them down. This will increase your abilities to recall clearly what is going on in your dreams, in your dreams. There are certainly different kinds of dreams and levels within each of those categories, but in simplest terms, let's just call them lucid dreams for now. Being aware of your dreams is the first step. Establishing the boundaries around your person and your home and your family members is the next step. Speak out loud, both in your mind and with your voice, that only those who can help you and benefit you are allowed near you and yours. I deeply appreciate the fact that you have been I deeply appreciate the fact that you have been through so much and have kept an open mind and heart. I suggest you keep listening to Steve as he is a good leader and a clear thinker. Each of those qualities are extremely rare these days. With all the care in my heart, Thomas Rice. There you go, Thomas. Thomas, appreciate your time, man. Appreciate that email. That's a kind, kind move. All right. I, uh, we have been absolutely flooded with emails, fresh ones, today and yesterday. But I finally got a chance to crack them open this morning. The emails are just broken, pounding in, and some very helpful ones. And uh, I really got Edgar in the back of my mind. Side note, um, I reached out an email. I am not going to start reaching out to a couple of his family members and colleagues yet because if, if, the, if what we hope has happened has happened, I'm quite sure his family and close friends aren't going to have too much time for some dude from the internet like me, right? So let's hope for the best, but I'm really starting to wonder what's up. And uh, let's just hope for the best in that department. All right, here we go. I'm going to go out and fling some arrows next, quickly. And then uh, make sure that's a part of my daily routine again. It's, uh, it's just something I've always done as a child, actually. But I just haven't had my, my target set up properly here yet. I'm going to do that real quick. Get some arrows into it. And then uh, carry on my day, knocking off important to-do items. i got to get this other boat sitting here staring at me, cleaned up and sold and out of here. This place is starting to look like a frickin' boat lock, for God's sakes. But anyway, keep, keep getting that information in, all right, you guys. Keep getting it in. And if you are directly connected with, Ed, with Edgar, um, drop me an email. Let me know what's up. Let me know how he is, all right? I'll be back shortly. Yeah. Uh -huh.